Hi, good afternoon, greetings to all, and good afternoon to all the ones in the East Coast. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation to this webinar titled Digital Evolution, a Path Forward for Higher Ed in a Post-COVID World. Today we are pleased to have Rachel Ray Clement. Uh, she's the Vice President of Industry Relations and Corporate Strategy at the Tambellini Group. And today also we are pleased to have more than 90 participants registered. So far we have how many? More than 30. So we hope that the rest can be able to enter uh, and connect with us live. If not, we are recording, so don't worry. But I would like to say special thank you to all the institutions in Puerto Rico who are more than 15 who accept our invitation and are here with us today. Also, we have uh, several from the United States, and I want to uh, say it by name because today webinars is in English and definitely it was more relaxed, uh, focused on the U.S. market, uh, our members there, and also others who who were able to join us as well. Today we have from U.S. Uh, Bronx Community College, the, from CUNY in New York. We also have the CUNY Graduate Center. We also have from Austin Community College, a Board of Manhattan Community College, New Jersey. City University, our new member. Also, we have from Tarrant County College, uh, the, the, the university that our chairman, Dr. Carlos, is. And also, California State University, San Bernardino, Florida Institute of Technology, and we also have from Palm Beach State College. We also have several international institutions as well. We have from Universidad Autónoma de Guadalajara, one of our members uh, internationals in Mexico. And we also have from UM, uh, UIM, uh, the ISA Talapa in Mexico. I don't know if I pronounced it well, sorry for that. Uh, we also have one from Russia, that is, the name is Volsk Medical College. I don't know if I pronounce it, sorry if I mispronounce. Uh, again, and also we have one particip participant from our collaborative partners from Internet Society in Puerto Rico chapter. So welcome everyone, greetings to all. We hope that this webinar will be of great benefit to everyone. We would like to recognize also that this series, series, uh, series of webinars was coordinated with the support of Dr. Carlos Morales, Chairman of the Heads Board of Directors and President of Ta uh, Tarrant County College Connect Campus. And since Heads' priority and commitment is to support and serve our more than 40 member institutions in Puerto Rico, Latin America, and the United States and other institutions that participate as well, since we welcome uh, Vela, the academic community in general. So thank you very much, Dr. Morales, for being here with us. Also, he will be moderating the Q&A section at the end. But before we begin, as you may see, the ones who enter Vela uh, before three of uh, a three uh, this semester uh, uh, for this semester we may welcome presentation with the announcements and promotion of the upcoming webinars to be able to dedicate uh, most time on our special guests like today with Rachel. But I just want to emphasize uh, two. Uh, announcements. First of all, at the end of the webinar, you will be receiving an email with the link to a short electronic uh, survey so you can complete it to help us evaluate this webinar and also help us uh, identify which services or head services and initiatives can support the faculty, the administrators, and also their uh, your students and how and and help us to identify which are the the most uh, effective ways to promote it. Is uh is our all of almost all of them are closed question. You only have to select. It's not taking you more than five minutes. So in order to complete it, and the service is anonymous. Your input and feedback are very valuable for us. And finally, I invite you. 
again, to share with others the invitation to our webinars so they, uh, that your, their, your colleagues also can register and participate and benefit from these webinars as well. Our next webinar, remember, for faculty and administrator will be on uh, the date is uh, April 15th. A uh, very important day, uh, the tax day. And this will be with Dr. Estela Porto. And that the topic will be live and online finding what works for synchron synchronous class meetings. And also, thank you, Stephanie, for putting the, the, the promotion there. If you follow us in our social media uh, accounts, you can see the promotion and also in the, the heads homepage next events you will see all the different events there and you can uh, click there and then register from there and webinar and also we have a webinar for students that uh, is it will be in spanish emprendimiento emocional la ciencia de la psicología en emprendimiento with dr marieli uh, marieli rios uh, that will be on march uh, april excuse me 16 uh, that will be during the morning at 10 p.m. and this one will be by via Zoom. So please uh, help us promote this among your students and also if you, you are invited to join us as well if you want to. Remember that all these webinars are free of shows, charge and you just need to register to participate. Now we are ready to start our webinar and I am pleased to present Dr. Carlos Morales, head chair, who will be moderate uh, the webinar and present our guest speaker today. Carlos. Thank you, Belkis. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today it is my honor to present our speaker for the uh, afternoon. Ray Clemens, Rachelle Clemens, she is Vice President of uh, Industry Relations and Corporate Strategy at the Tambellini Group. It's a higher yes, education. Can, Carlos, we, can, we can see your uh, uh, video. If you can oh, I'm sorry. Oh, can you no see problem. me? Yes. Now you are. Can you see me now? Okay. So, <clears throat> as I was saying, uh, Rachel is Vice President of uh, Industry Relations and Corporate Strategy at the Tambellini Group, which is a higher education industry um, analyst that provides strategic counsel and insights to IT leaders and higher education uh, focused technology companies and solution providers in uh, uh, the market. She has over 25 years of experience uh, and leadership in information technology, product marketing, communications, business development and sales. Prior to the Tambellini Group, she served as the CIO at Texas Women's University, Davidson College, St. Norbert College, and Menlo College. Uh, one, one additional element that I want to mention is that um, Rachel and I um, are colleagues uh, for, I guess, more than, than 12, 15 years, and <laughs> we have been um, in the higher education sector trying to find solutions to uh, using technology and uh, we go uh, back as we say in english here we went to uh, leadership uh, uh, conferences together so with that said it is my pleasure to uh, present and introduce my colleague and friend ray clemens rachel take it away thank you so much carlos and and you're right we go back i was just thinking about this the other day we go back i think at least 12 years um and uh, we met in Atlanta. I think I was living in California. You might have been in Puerto Rico, and now we live about 45 minutes away from each other. So uh, it's, it's funny where life takes us. Yes. So I'm really um, delighted to be here with you all today. Can everybody, uh, can, is, my, is my, are my screen showing or the, the slides showing? I just want to make sure. Yes. OK, great. So oops, I don't know what I just did, but now it is not showing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. now it's up here. Um, I thought I moved it forward. Oh, no. You're back. That's back. Okay. I was looking to advance the slide. There we go. So I don't need to go through my information, but one of the did, uh, things I did hear, um, since Carlos did such a great job of introducing me, but one of the things that I did hear is that we have Cal State San Bernardino on the call, somebody from Cal State San Bernardino. And I actually started my career um, at Cal State East Bay, and I'm a Cal State alum. So I have a special place in my heart for the, for the CSU system. So today, I'd like to start us off with a quote. 
Um, this is from Klaus Schwab, who's the uh, founder and chairman of the World Economic Foundation. And what he proclaims is that we stand on the brink of a revolution. He goes on to say, not in this quote, but in, in other um, content, that the fourth industrial revolution is changing everything, including what it means to be human. Now, that can sound pretty hyperbolic, but we do see evidence of these shifts, uh, especially fourth industrial revolution type shifts going on all around us. So this idea of this technological revolution has led to a significant push for digital transformation across a multitude of industries, perhaps all of them, including higher education. So the question is, well, what is digital transformation? <laughs> um, Educause, which I hope uh, many of you are familiar with, Educause is the high, uh, a US-based uh, higher education IT association for, um, for higher ed IT professionals. They define digital transformation as a series of shifts, and so those are cultural, those are technological, and those are workforce shifts that enable new models and can transform an institution's direction and their value proposition. And if you think about it, that's really weighty stuff, something that, that completely changes what the value proposition is for an institution. So here's where I'd like to be maybe a little bit controversial. And if you know me, and I know Carlos does, I'm always a little bit controversial. But what I'd like to propose is that this is the wrong construct for thinking about digital and higher education. Not that Educause is necessarily wrong in how they define it, but simply that this isn't the right framework for us to, um, to use or to consider. Now, I don't want you to misconstrue what I'm saying. I actually do think that industry, the industry of higher education, individual institutions will need to make cultural and workforce and technology shifts. And I think we'll have to look at our educational and operating models. We're just facing an unprecedented amount of pressure. And the challenges that we're seeing in higher education today aren't really coming one at a time as they have in the past, but they're really coming at institutions from all different directions. So what are those challenges? Well, I like to think about them in sort of four buckets with this overlay of what's happened over the last year, and that's the sort of COVID effect, right? So the first set of challenges are really societal and technological shifts that we see as a result of the fourth industrial revolution. New technologies like artificial intelligence, um, quantum computing have really accelerated the pace of change. We hear that a lot, but I'd like to give you an example of how much they've accelerated the pace of change. So when the telephone was introduced, it took 50 years for it to reach 50 million, what we would now call users, but I don't know that you would call it in the telephone age a, a user, but 50 million people um, took 50 years to get the telephone. The computer took 14 years for it to reach 50 million people. Pokemon Go, does anybody remember that uh, video game that got introduced a couple years ago, sort of an augmented reality game, Pokemon Go? How long do you think it took Pokemon Go to reach 50 million users? So we've got 50 years for the phone, we've got 14 years for the computer. It took 19 days for Pokemon Go to reach 50 million users. It is just a phenomenal pace of change. We're also seeing um, the increase of robots in the workplace. They've more than doubled in the last decade. And we see six times more devices than people connected to the internet. So for every person, there's six times that many devices connected to the internet. And it's not just technology either that's changing or that's increasing, it's also information. So we create new knowledge or at least new information every day now. And by some accounts, it's cycling. The amount of um, new knowledge that's been created is, is doubling every 12 hours. So it's a significant implications for the half-life of professional skills, which in some cases now is only just a couple of years. Institutions, as you know, are also faced with changing needs and expectations. So the things that we hear all hear about demographic shifts, different generational preferences. We now have uh, Gen Z, we've got millennials, uh, Gen Xers, which I am, and boomers sort of all in the workforce and, and in some cases in our institutions. And evolving workforce requirements have all contributed to changes in public's expectations and needs from higher education. There's been this really interesting, at least here in the US, there's been an interesting erosion of trust in public institutions. And by public institutions, I don't mean like public versus private universities, but I mean those serving the public good. And that includes education. And so what we've seen now is that the perception of the value or the importance of a college education has decreased significantly in the last several years. So among young Americans, and those are described as 18 to 29 year old um, Americans, in 2013, 
rated um, a college education as very important. This is according to a Gallup poll, but only 41% rated it the same, very important in 2019. That's a drop of 33 percentage points in just six years. Also with the cost of college and student loan debt at an all time high, many Americans are simply asking themselves if higher education is even worth it. We've also seen this really interesting rise of new competition and model models emerge for um, you know what I would say is the first time. Not that competition didn't exist before, but the um, the, the actual threat that it presents to higher education is much more um, prominent. Again, because of the rising cost of college, this reduced half life of professional skills, and emerging technologies, they've all created this opportunity and opening for new educational models. Um, and um, institutions are now facing this competition sort of from all fronts. They're facing it from other institutions where once you might have regional competition and now you can have national and international because of online education, like uh, TCC Connect where Carlos works or um, leads. You see alternative educational providers like boot camps and other things like that. And you're even seeing employers like Google and Amazon and others getting into the educational or at least the skills development um, game. And then, of course, we all know we're facing financial and regulatory pressures. Uh, that's that's not news to anybody, but um, but they're just increasing, right? There's more focus on compliance. There's more focus on accountability, and so there are now studies that look at you know institutional viability. And by some accounts, several hundred institutions could end up going out of business in the next couple of years. And then, of course, all these trends have been exacerbated by COVID-19. So it's because of all these pressures and trends that I've really been a longstanding and pretty vocal proponent of the need for higher education to change. For the last half of my time as a CIO, in fact, I talked about digital transformation. It was something that I advocated for, that I said we have to think about, we have to do, and it even made its way into one of my um, like IT department mission statements at one point. So our goal was to drive digital transformation. Um, so I, I say that to say that I'm not a I'm not a somebody who comes at this from the perspective that digital transformation is necessarily bad. But I would say that my thinking has um, evolved somewhat on on this topic, and you know, no pun intended there. Um, but when I look at the word transformation and what it really means, I just can't help but wonder if it's the right framework for thinking about change in higher education. So this is what I'd like to test with you. To transform is to have this very dramatic and complete change. It, it, it's going from one thing to another. Um, synonyms are like convert, metamorphosis. So you think about this caterpillar and butterfly where it goes from, you know, metamorph, it morphs, <laughs> it morphs from this caterpillar state to this butterfly state. And it can, it is completely changed, it's completely transformed. It also implies it has a very clear beginning and an end, right? Once it gets to a butterfly, it doesn't really go anywhere after that. It's just a butterfly. On the other hand, evolution has a much more um, slow connotation, and I'm not sure I really buy into that as the framework, but it also means to go from simple to complex, to develop something new from a pre-existing form. And if you look at the synonyms here, it's to expand, to mature, to grow, right? So it's really um, this maturation of things versus this complete uh, makeover of something. So I think there might be a small number of institutions that we might think of as being transformed, some you know, very notable ones like um, Southern New Hampshire, SMHU, maybe ASU. But I guess the question I have is, have they really changed completely? Have they really transformed? Do they have a truly different operating model, if you think back to that definition, or a completely different value proposition? Or have they simply become more complex and more evolved organizations? My thinking is that transformation is really rare, and the language of transformation is potentially alienating and might stunt actual progress being made, right? And we see this in other language when we talk about innovation, which I've done a lot of work around in my career as well, that that notion of innovation actually makes it harder and sometimes, sometimes to innovate. So the change that institutions need to go through to address today's circumstances and challenges doesn't really have a beginning and end state in my mind. It really is evolutionary in nature. I think we need to continue to adapt and change and grow. And I also think it's gonna look really different for different institutions. So just like living organisms adapted differently to live in the Sahara versus the Arctic, institutions themselves will have to adapt differently depending on their environments, their circumstances, their needs, their students. Um, it seems clear to me that the one size fits all brush that we often paint higher education with doesn't really hold up 
when you look at the many nuances segment, nuanced segments of this industry. Right, a community college, and I heard there are a lot of community colleges on this um, on this call, are very different than private liberal arts. You have different students, different needs, and research institutions are very different than regional public institutions. The one thing I do think you have in common, though, and I think they all have in common, is this, that we have to move away from this binary thinking about technology. This is either tech enabled or it isn't and really focus on creating environments where digital technologies and capabilities and experiences become sort of seamlessly woven into the organization and become this part of our, you know, an imbued part of our DNA, just as any other living organism would evolve in this type of uh, in this type of changing environment. So what does that look like? What might a digital university look like under these circumstances. I think when we think about technology, we say, well, it already plays this, this really large and significant role in our university. And I think that it's mostly there today to facilitate the way that we've always done business. And it's often this kind of layer on top, right? We just sort of put technology on top. So it's not woven into the fabric in the way that I think this digital evolution might and should look like. But what if we started with a blank slate? What if we asked if what, you know, how technology could really enable us now, um, unconstrained by those existing processes and shaped by our student and faculty experiences? So what I'd like to do is paint a picture of what's possible at an institution and what a digital college and university could look like. Some of these I think you might agree with, some of them you might go, whoa, that's, that's pretty crazy. But I just want to give you a sense of what the, what's possible, the art of the possible. So if we think about the recruiting admissions area, you can imagine there would be virtual recruiters nudging students and then moving them through the admissions funnel. And by virtual recruiters, I don't mean somebody sitting on the other end of Zoom, I mean technology that's really filling that role and serving that sort of function of, of nudging and, and helping guide students through an admissions funnel. We would think about things like artificial intelligence and machine learning powered systems can ingest the records, make articulation decisions, and, um, and make an, an admit decision within hours, maybe even minutes, not the days or weeks that it takes people to process that now, even with the assistance of the technology we have. And they would only flag records that needed sort of a human intervention thing, but then you could see a cycle of learning or knowledge come from that where they wouldn't necessarily have to flag them at that same time. Of course, we've heard a lot about, and I saw um, the chief innovation officer from Dallas College, so I suspect he'll talk about blockchain, um, but we would see students owning their own educational record, right? So there's no need for the institution to be involved. They could share them on the blockchain, share them with prospective employers or other institutions, um, and we wouldn't need to sort of be in the middle of that process to know that they're authentic. And then on the payment side, you can imagine students using Venmo to pay their admissions deposits or maybe paying by Bitcoin in the future. Once a student is admitted onto campus, um, we could see things like algorithms providing students with their optimal schedule with which, which they could accept and modify. So think very much instead of, hmm, I need to go out, look at the class schedule, think what it is. You know, here, Rachel, here, here's a, a proposed schedule for you. You know, accept, accept, modify, whatever you want to do with it. We could see students reserving their place in line for anything that they wanted to, sort of via an app or via um, you know, some kind of technology. So they just show up at their designated time. But really, why do we even need lines and, and you know, sort of those old processes, right? We could do virtual appointments or we could actually just prompt students to do things like, do you want to, um, you know, do you want to renew your parking sticker? Choose yes, no, change, you know, change which parking sticker I get, right? And so it can automatically happen through a proactive nudge rather than, rather than me having to go wait in line to get my parking sticker. Sensors could tell students where the closest available parking lot is or parking space rather, could also tell them when the rec center has a machine that's available to them and oh, by the way, you have a break in your classes, go get 20 minutes on your treadmill right now. Proximity trackers and recommendations en engines could show you activities of interest near you based on your schedule. We could see cell phones and biometric scanners replacing ID cards and that's happening um, a little bit now, providing access to facilities and services. So this one is interesting because it actually happened a lot during COVID. We'd see students starting to order meals from the dining hall via an app, uh, which, you know, when I started and <laughs> giving this presentation like a year ago wasn't really happening and now it happens a lot. Um, and maybe even having robots deliver, uh, deliver it to them across campus. We could see virtual advisors and virtual counselors. And again, by virtual, I mean not a human being sitting on Zoom, but actual technology 
providing personalized check-ins and recommendations and pathways for students and sort of escalating or working them into sort of a, a more live um, environment where, you know, where that's warranted and where those cases need to escalate. I also think operations at universities could look really different with a reduction of staff um, needed to do routine operating work and processing. And I think this gets really scary for some institutions and for some staff in particular to think that, well, you know, with technology, it could replace us. I think the really important thing to understand here is that technology can do routine things really well, but not you know, really humanly centered things. And so what we want to do is have humans not do routine stuff, which is kind of boring and dull. Um, we want technology to do that. And we want people to do those things that really require that face-to-face -face interaction. So imagine if you had robots that cleaned and sterilized your facilities, facilities and maintain your lawns, like kind of a Roomba on steroids. Uh, if administrative processes were largely op automated and completed through, you know, AI technology, so think things like expense reports and scheduling meetings and employee application reviews. On IT side, if I've got any IT folks here, things like security reviews, right? Just having an automated process. Process. I don't know about you, but I never like completing my expense reports. So if somebody else or something else could do it for me, that would be a huge time savings, and it would be greatly appreciated uh, on my part. The other thing I think we'll see is operational dashboards providing a consolidated view into key data points and activities for the day by role. So I know if you're working on a university campus, you're probably logging into multiple systems. You've got a checklist over here. You've got to do's over here. You maybe have uh, workflow prompts over here in this third system. And all these different things, you've got your reports in a different system. So bringing that all together, either by role or, you know, I'm an administrator or by person and saying, look, here's your, you know, your centralized view of everything you've got going on and across all these different systems and things you need to focus on today. Uh, if we have faculty on the call, teaching and learning could also be significantly augmented by technology. Some of these also can sound a little bit scary, but teacher bots can review work and provide feedback and handle tutoring and other academic support where appropriate, again, at sort of a, a rudimentary level. When I say teacher bots, I don't mean replacing teaching with bots, but rather augmenting teaching with bots, right? We see this a lot in um, a lot of different areas now, but there are ways in which technology can do uh, sort of like low level essay review and provide really, you know, sp specific feedback on types of essays so that teachers can focus on some of the higher order um, thinking and work that needs to happen. Grading can be handled by the system and not just for multiple choice assessments. Learning, I think, will be much more immersive. History courses will use VR to teach you about Rome in Rome, or anatomy courses will allow you to dissect in a virtual environment. Dancers can capture their movement and get feedback on sort of their physical structure as well as the aesthetics of, of the actual dance, and what was happening there. Systems can be used to identify gaps in student engagement and learning and automatically prescribe interventions in real time. So many of our interventions that we have today are trailing indicators because they happen so much after the fact. But what if we can see those things and, and, and intervene as they're happening and really, um, you know, really help students along in the moment? And then we could also think about faculty nudges too. So are there places where the lecture that was given, the key concept wasn't unclear, you know, wasn't super clear or students struggle at that particular point. And how could that help faculty better tailor their content? And then I think we'll also see this, the degrees, um, how students earn degrees and the jobs that they assume post-graduation um, differing as well. So we could imagine students automatically badging, getting badges when they master key learning outcomes or competencies on their way to their, to their degree, whether that's a two-year or four-year degree that we wouldn't be sending transcripts again, because as we talked about, that would sort of all be credentialed via the blockchain. And we'll see this incredible emphasis on human skills, right? So those things that are really key to being human, evaluation, decision-making, communicating, managing, leading, but less sort of task-oriented or, or um, uh, information-based, right? Because the information is always changing, one, and because you can, you know, essentially Google it, too. So really the idea that, that you have to think about processing information versus just knowing information. So what I'd like to point out about all of these examples and this picture that I've painted is that everything I've described is currently possible and in many cases is already being done in at least one higher education institution in North America.
but they don't fundamentally change, in my view, the business model of institutions. They represent an evolution of it, and they make it more relevant in today's environment and more student-centered. Let's see, okay, so as much as I love technology, and I do love technology, I was a CIO for 10 years, um, I'm the first to say that it isn't the answer to all problems, and we should never, ever adopt technology for technology's sake. So all those things that I mentioned, super cool, right? <laughs> but some of them may be appropriate for your campus, some may not. So when faced with all these possibilities for a digital campus, how do we decide what we should do, what we could do, and where we should start? I think one of the filters that we really should be thinking about and potentially a really good filter is on this idea of experience, both student experience as well as employee experience, which I actually would argue is not just, just a filtering criteria for digital decision making, but it's also an important pursuit in its own right. So experience, if we just think about this, and I'm gonna hold up, it's in a case, but me, like everybody else, many people have an iPhone, right? Experience is what drives us in so many as other aspects of our lives. It, it, it drives what we buy, it drives where we eat, it drives what products or brands like the iPhone that we have an affinity for, our favorite sports teams, and so much more, right? How we feel about something, uh, the, the ease of use, the, the complicated or, or lack of complicated experience, and that sense of connection that we, um, that we get from things is a huge part of how we make decision making. But for the most part, this doesn't exist in our institutions with one really important exception. There's often a very strong affinity between and connection between faculty and students. Um, and that's really important, that's a good thing. <laughs> um, but what, you know, but the rest of the university as a whole, there, there's not as much of that connection. So as we think about our digital evolution, one amazing thing that technology can do is help us look at the sum total of students' interactions with our institutions or their journey through our institutions, if you will, and it can help us begin to paint this picture of what that experience is. And then it allows us to act on that experience. So it, it allows us to create the ability to create this unique and personalized experience for each and every student. When I say that, I don't mean every type of student because that's generally, if we're gonna to segment today, how we segment, right? We think about a type of student. I was a adult learner, I was a returner, you know, a returning non-traditional student. Those are all words that would have been used for my type of student. Um, you know, there might be a Pell eligible students or first gen students or first time in college students. Um, and those are all categories, those are types of students. What I'd like to see is move past types to individuals, right? Speak to Rachel or Ray, which is what everybody calls me, as Ray. Um, so what does this look like? Well, it's, it's knowing me as me, right? It's speaking directly to me. It's using all those you know, pieces of information or all the things that you know about me to, to figure out how to connect with me individually, not as a type, but as a person. It's doing things like pre-populating information. Uh, so you don't have to um, ask me things that you already know about me. And, and uh, I mean, if you think about that and think about all the places that we ask students for information that we already know about them, that's sort of the antithesis of, of really creating a connection and a bond. Or just simply not asking for the information at all if we already know that we know it. It's creating this personalized and consistent, I'm gonna use a very retail-y sort of word, but omni-channel experience which is that at every place, every touch point, at every office, at every, you know, every interaction with the institution, that it has the same consistent set of information, set of experiences, it knows and understands me um, in the same way, right? So financial aid and the bursar's office and the registrar's office and the website and the portal all have the same set of information about me and can treat me as that unique human being. It's preemptive and proactive versus making me go and do that heavy lifting, right? So, you know, again, that example of, do you wanna renew your parking permit? If we know a student isn't living on campus and we know that they had to, um, they, they bought a parking permit last year, why do we then make them go through the process every year of walking into the parking permit office or sent, you know, going to the parking permit website and sending in that information it's that that's a very, you know, they have to take that step, the student has to take that action instead of us sort of prompting that and saying, hey, we know you, we already know you got a parking permit last time, can we help you do it again this time? 
It's tailoring checklists and to do's. It's tailoring language to be specific to me. And it's structuring engagement based on me, not based on the university sort of department and structures and silos. And that could include a multilingual engagement, right? So I know that these webinars, some are in English and some are in Spanish, but you know, it could be any language. We now see um, institutions using chatbots that can communicate in over a hundred different languages. So it creates a more personalized environment. It's making recommendations for me based on where I am and what stage I am. It's matching me with a specific advisor or a mentor who is really who I'm really going to connect with because of, again, all these things that you know about me. Doing things that I have talked about for a long time um, that I think have real potential, and I, I wish I could see an institution that was doing this, but it's actually looking at something might, that might look like reverse scheduling, which is actually looking at student needs. So what classes do student needs? What classes do they want? What are their time uh, preferences and needs? And then creating a schedule uh, and then matching faculty to teach those classes at those times, as opposed to how we do it today, which of course is you know, college-based and then department-based and then faculty-based, and then you put out a schedule and then students have to sort of match up to it. So it's, it's flipping that on its head. These are... Uh, all ways that we could interact with students in a more personal way. There's also this idea that the entire academic offering that we have could be highly personalized as well. So that classes aren't necessarily constrained by a specific start and end date, by modality or by location, that we create this truly personalized educational experience for each and every student. But that's probably a conversation for another day. <laughs> so. I think the other thing we should think about when we think about ex uh, experience is that we can't overlook faculty and staff experience either, especially in a post-COVID world. More and more employees will have flexible work options and they'll, they'll, they'll have the ability to work from Dallas, Texas, which is where I am, uh, for a company in Puerto Rico. It doesn't require them to uproot their home or their children or their lives. And so we know that um, in other industries, that employee experience affects the customer's experience. So in our case, that would be our faculty or staff experience impacts our students' experience. Um, so that matters. And we haven't really thought about that much in higher education, about really making sure that our employee experience is an exceptional one, how that might trickle down to that student experience. So we've talked a little bit about what a digital university could look like, but what should it look like? And my, uh, my spouse is really fond of saying, just to our kids, just because you can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> and so just because you can do these things with technology doesn't necessarily mean you should. There are really serious implications of technology use that the industry, institutions, and individual faculty, staff, and students are going to have to grapple with as higher education digitally involves. And, and quite frankly, it's not just a higher education problem. We're going to have to grapple with this in our, in our everyday lives, but particularly as institutions in this context, we need to think about this. Over the last year, COVID has brought to the surface extreme inequities that exist in our system, not only the very real food and housing insecurities that we that many of us knew about, but we also saw this growing digital divide between those who had access to technology and even more importantly, access to broadband access and those who didn't. We've also seen rising concerns over equity in everything from the software that institutions are using around things like online proctoring to the algorithms that are being used to guide interventions in the name of student success. We haven't given much thought to what assumptions these technologies make or who's programming them, for example. We know that the technology field as a, as a discipline in, in and of itself is predominantly male and predominantly white. And so what does that mean for the technology that we are now imposing upon our, our employees and on our students? We have to remember that tech isn't neutral and it can serve to perpetuate and even exacerbate existing biases. We've seen that a lot in our world, right? We've seen it in facial recognition software, we've seen it in software that supports policing or supports sentencing in the courts, and even in software that supports education. An example of that, the well-documented inability of many technologies to recognize people with darker skin color or to misinterpret behavior associated with common disabilities can lead to really damaging outcomes for our most vulnerable students. So in a world that's been completely reshaped by these technologies, 
what might this mean for those who, th who thrive and for those who get left behind? And then I think there's a really important question around privacy. We are collecting troves of data, right? There's data in everything. There's data in the Wi-Fi that you use. There's data in the software and the systems that we're using. Do our students know that we're collecting this about them? Do we tell them how it's been used? And do they have any kind of say in either of those things? And, and quite frankly, as faculty and staff, do we have any say in, in those types of things? And do we know? I think in institutions, there really can be an element of paternalism that, that comes into play around our students, right? It's very well-meaning, but it's really in the interest of supporting students and enabling them to succeed. But perhaps what we really need to be doing is giving them some sense of agency in these decisions and helping them to develop the knowledge and skills um, that they need to begin to manage the, the rest of their digital lives. Because it's gonna become a, a critical competency, not just for how we interact with them in institutions, but really for all of us moving forward. So I did say I was a fan of technology, right? I'm not trying to tell you technology is bad. <laughs> I'm not trying to tell you it's inherently good either. What I'm just trying to say is, look, it's not neutral. And our technology design decisions really need to be cognizant of these um, privacy and equity and access issues and not serve to exacerbate them, but rather help us work to ameliorate them. So with all of that in mind, with a picture of what digital evolution or a digital university could be, uh, you know, but also knowing some of the perils of technology, where do we go from here? How can, how can you get started in your institutions? Well, the thing I would say is, you know, start with your why. You know, don't do technology for technology's sake, but really, or, or because everyone else is doing it. Well, the university over there has this software or this, this you know, technology is used here, but do it because it really supports the value that you're trying to bring, bring the students that you have, the things that will shape their experience. I would also say pick a pain point, pick something that's an actual one, right? We often adopt technology because it's cool, because it's the latest, because it's shiny, um, but not necessarily because we, uh, we have a real pain point that we're trying to solve. But if we think about that evolutionary process, the key to it is actually doing, uh, enabling us to do something that, that was a real problem before, right? So flip, it's kind of hard to walk if you've got fins, but if you've got feet, like you can walk a lot better. And so helping institutions evolve, by doing something that, that that was possible but really hard to do, you know, can be a really important step in that process. The other thing that's really important is to think about this from a human-centered design, um, utilizing a human-centered centered design process. So we love solutioning. IT people love it. Um, our institutions love it. We have a problem. We jump to a solution, but we don't actually dig into, well, what is the real problem that we're trying to solve and for whom? You know, is it an administrative problem? Is it really a problem for our students? And, and what is their experience when they're doing that? So understanding the user, right, the person who is at the end of that, that process, what you're trying to solve for, and, and their real job to be done, right? Not just the task that they're trying to do, but the thing that they're really trying to get accomplished can be hugely important into, um, you know, implementing a good technology design. Start small and iterate. So don't try to boil the ocean. Don't even try to transform the, the whole institution at once. Um, but pick, pick a real problem and tackle it like something very small or pick a small group. Like it could be an institutional institution wide thing, but pick a small group, work with them, kind of work through the bugs and then expand from there. Utilize practices like lean startup or agile that really closely align sort of the problem to the solutioning and then, you know, to the development of the solutioning and then kind of this iterative cycle so that you can stay really close to that and make sure you are, in fact, staying in tune with the problem that you're trying to solve and that you're not developing more than you need to to solve that problem. An example of this is, you know, how many of us have been on committees or projects that have lasted, you know, two or three years and by the time you get to the end of the project, the conditions have changed. I mean, you successfully delivered it, but the conditions have changed and either it doesn't really apply or it didn't really solve the problem or the problem has evolved since then or it's no longer needed. So let's not do that, right? The more that you can sort of pick up, the more that you can stay close to that, um, that, that problem solution set, the faster you can begin to iterate on these things and the more that you'll be able to tick off over time. And then, of course, keeping equity at the forefront, right? So being mindful of those things, those biases that can creep into the system and be thinking about, well, who, who benefits and who's harmed from this process? And then I would just say rinse, repeat, use this whole cycle again, right? Align to the mission, pick a pain point, do some design, iterate, uh, and, and start all over again. 
All right. So with that, I um, come to the end of what I want to say. And any questions? Hi. I'm mute. So sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Uh, remember to use the chat. Yeah. Go ahead, uh, Carlos. Well, first of all, very, very uh, interesting presentation, the one that Rachel uh, provided to us and the perspective um, among the digital university and, and again, all the associated elements that she that she discussed. I'm not sure if we have a question ready, but if as you get one, maybe I'll ask the first one. Um, do you can can you talk uh, and I and I know that you mentioned some of these, but can you expand a little bit more in terms of the personalized learning and and how it plays with uh, data analytics and again the benefits of all that? Yeah. So um, if I guess I, I'm not totally sure I understand the question, but I mean the the more that we understand about our students, of course, the more personalized we can become in our in, in in crafting experiences from them right and we have a lot of data about our students across our organizations but it's it's often um, in lots of different places so you've got some of it in a student system some of it in an LMS system some of it in the head of a faculty member who's sitting in the history department who's interacted with them some of it on a spreadsheet from a department chair and so really understanding and some of it's not necessary at all and some of it's incredibly robust information that would help us um, support and enable students in a more personalized way. So there's a there's a huge movement right that we see right now towards a more um, data driven institutional approach and really thinking about what that data strategy is and how you kind of manage and, and create the centralized view of data that resides all over our institutions to create that seamless experience. The downside of that, as I sort of said at the end, or the or the cautionary tale of that is, you know, that's a lot of data that's out there <laughs> that we are making assumptions by about. And so understanding where there's the potential for bias in those assumptions is really critically important. And also helping our students, you know, understand that this data is is their data. Um, it's about them and that they have sort of the right to participate or not, but seeing where there are benefits to their participation um, can be really valuable. Thank you, Rachel. We have a question from Andres Orejuela. I'm not sure if it is on the chat or if he is going to use the microphone. Jubelkis, can you tell? I think he wants to use the microphone. Uh, can you see if you can activate your microphone? If not, then you have to. Andres to write it on the chat. Check if you can activate. Uh, yes, I can share. I think I can the microphone. Thank you um, for uh, setting that up. Uh, first of all, thank you to the organizers. And uh, can you all hear me? Yeah? Yes. yes. OK. Uh, yes. Please identify which institution you are with. Amy. OK, I will. Um, I'm, I'm uh, working at the City University of New York at the Honors College. So I've been um, working with instructional technology there for uh, a few years now. And um, and I just want to say thank you to Ray Clemens for the talk. I guess what I think would have the most impact from my experience at a large public university uh, with many different colleges um, is something uh, like the reverse scheduling, which I think is also being used, you know, in the healthcare industry, for example, to eliminate waste. Uh, and, you know, so doctors aren't sitting in their offices without that, without patients. I think for like a university like mine, it might help students graduate. Uh, I think we see this at large public universities across the United States. Um, you know, students take more than four years to graduate uh, because their classes aren't offered or something like that. So I was just wondering if um, Ray Clements had, if you had seen uh, some sort of reverse scheduling in use uh, or, and whether or not it could be used over a multi-year period uh, in order to facilitate graduation rates. I think that would be a useful um, and interesting, that was a very interesting part of your talk. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It's something I've been talking about for a few years because I just think the idea of it is like, 
um, I, technically it's not it's not necessarily super easy, but it sort of has this beautiful elegance of of thinking about how we really flip the paradigm for student centeredness, right? So if we really want to be student centered, we actually start with the students and not with you know the organization and what the organization needs. I have not seen it in use. I think some of the things that are being used that get towards that level of personalization but aren't that are more um, uh, some of the systems that are really working more towards degree pathways and making it much clearer to students what the you know what the, the three things are that they need next and really kind of helping nurturing them through that process where I think it should get to are some of the other things that I mentioned like you know I mean, why we have to have a student go in and pick his or her schedule or their schedule is, is just sort of ludicrous if we know what degree program they're in and we know what their interests are, right? We should at least present a, a draft like proposal <laughs> schedule um, for them to start out with and then they can modify from there. Because again, you're helping to, there's a whole bunch, there's a whole field of behavioral economics that, that comes into play here, but it, it talks about how um, default choices are um, one of the things it talks about, are, you know, about default choices and how people tend to stick with the default. So if we default them to towards the things that allow them to get further along that path to graduation, like that's actually benefiting them and it's benefiting us. But when we default to a blank slate, then you know, blank page, which is essentially what reg registration is every every semester or quarter, depending on what system you're on, then um, then we're making it that like exponentially harder for them to do that. Thank you for that question, and uh, Andres. Uh, See, no, Carla, I just want to say thank you so much, Rachel. I have to leave because I have another thing. thing at 4 p.m. But I leave you with Carlos and Jelisa, who are taking care of the Q&A. Thank you so much. I hope that when the pandemic ends, we can bring you here to Puerto Rico face-to-face -face or any other venue that we can do a face-to-face -face event. Thank you so much for this interesting uh, topic that we learned a lot. Uh, the rest of you continue enjoying the webinar and thank you so much for your participation and accepting our invitation. Take care. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Belkis. I was going to say, you know, the 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 question that uh, Andres posed is an interesting one, and and in the case of of us in Texas, and I'm not sure in 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 New York, uh, but there is performance-based funding, okay? And you know, there is there's going to be a a true interest in in something like that, you know, like the reverse scheduling, simply because your your budget is going to be positively impacted by the number of students you graduate on time. So, you know, maybe maybe that's another session that we may need to schedule, <laughs> but you know, it is it is an interesting element and thank you for for that question, uh, uh, Andres. Uh, Yelixa, do you see do you see any other questions from the audience? Uh no, we we haven't I've received any questions. I just see a comment from Dr. Milagros Paras. Uh, thank you for the excellent presentation and the excellent work Heads Always Does. Um, is there you. anyone thank else with questions? You can use the microphone or you can use the, the chat. Let me ask another question while we, we get colleagues, uh, uh, you know, getting those thoughts uh, aligned. Mm -hmm. um, Rachel, um, I, I guess, you know, I, I, two questions. One is, you mentioned the digital university and certainly uh, uh, that is a key element uh, that has been mentioned in terms of not, not only the natural evolution, but at some point, you know, kind of a guided evolution of institutions. Uh, yep. do, you, do you have any, any examples of um, um, college institutions uh, if, if you are able to provide names or situations where they are using, you know, a, a lot of a lot of services that then qualify them as a digital university along the lines of what you described. Yeah, I, so interestingly enough, all of those examples that I used, I actually, and I pulled it out of my notes because I, I knew it was going to be too long, but I actually cite the institution or, insti you know, at least one institution that's doing each of those things. So there are, are definitely places, um, you know, in, including here in Texas, and especially here in Texas, actually, they're using blockchain, of course. Um, we know that's happening also between, like, there's a, an experiment going on with, I think, Salesforce Community College and ASU to, to do sort of a blockchain credentialing. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the virtual advising, virtual admissions, virtual yeah, like Georgia's doing a lot of work around that. There's chatbots that are sort of getting into that space to really help institutions, um, you know, become more proactive and, and responsive in a, um, in an augmented way, right? The virtual assistant. And in fact, I think the numbers I saw around that the virtual admissions example in Georgia were something like. Oh gosh, it was it was extraordinary the 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 benefit they got on it. Like eighty five or ninety percent of of the you know what they would have fielded as these like low level phone calls could actually be sort of supported and enabled through this process. So it was a huge benefit to the institution and to students because they get what they need immediately um, at any hour of the day or night. The uh, the robots on campus, like delivering food, those are things that we're also seeing. So we see different institutions picking up pockets of it. Um, I don't know that there's any, with maybe a couple of really, you know, well-known exceptions like ASU, who who kind of tries everything. <laughs> um, right. I don't know that there's any example of one one specific institution that's kind of done all of it. Um, but I think that's a little bit of my point, right? Like everybody's going to have to evolve in a slightly different way, and not everybody needs to look like an ASU or look like a, you know. Um, a TCC connect or something like that because you all are living in sort of different habitats with different needs and constraints that will change what your evolutionary process looks like. So it's more of a needs, you know, aligning the needs with the proper not, not only decision but solution here for, for, right. for the for the as all technology should, but I don't think we do it enough, just to be honest. I mean I think we pick solutions because they're shiny and cool because other people are doing them. <laughs> Yes, yes, I have heard that. Uh, one, one additional question, and, and again, you alluded to to some of these. Um, the b before the pandemic, there was a forecast, and it was X, right? And now with the pandemic, and of course, you, we are not done with that, and we don't know when, right? There's right. there's now uh, that forecast is being rewritten. Uh, uh, can you or do you have? Do you have a, a, a way of connecting those two iterations? So if the first uh, forecast based on pre-pandemic and maybe the evolution and the route that, that these things need to take and what has happened and what has accelerated due to the pandemic. Can you, can you talk about maybe those two elements? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, if you go back to those four different sort of categories, I think it looks a little bit different in each of them. But I, th I think pre-pandemic, it was like the the enrollment cliff is coming. Uh, institutions need to change. Um, you know, the the growing population is adult, you know, adult and non-traditional students, of which I was one, um, and first-generation students um, in in some of our states, um, and. You know, I, I don't know that online or this notion of like the super flexible university was was I mean, it was there and lots of institutions were doing it, but I don't think it was there in as prominent of ways as it is now. I think now what we see is all of those are true, but we've also learned more about what students want because of the pandemic. And we see this really interesting sort of bifurcation of like there's a doubling down in, of the kind of 18 to 22 year old like residential face to face like people really crave people right now <laughs> because we we can't be around people right now right. and and some of our students i mean in high school and in, in early college like that that experience has been really disrupted for them and so those types of institutions that deliver that type of experience are I mean, they're really doubling down on it. They're not going hybrid or online. They're they're like going all in on face to face. But I think a lot of other institutions who are serving, um, you know, community colleges and serving non traditional students and 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 serving more regional populations and things like that. I think there's a whole different level of you know. Again, I said it's not really binary. It's it's no longer is it online or is it face to face. But like, how do we really start to create these blended and seamless environments that that give people sort of what they want and what they need when they want and when they need it and make education more accessible and attainable for for populations who aren't like doubling down in person but who also recognize that they can't just do this 100 percent online like they're missing mm -hmm. something there right and so i think that's a really interesting thing that we're seeing is this this emergence of the like the flex you know the flexitarian type of university mm -hmm. um, and what that means and, and how institutions are going to solve for that all right, exciting, exciting times. Well, yes. um, we are 
one minute over our uh, prescribed time, and I want to again thank you, Rachel, for uh, sharing with us uh, your knowledge, your expertise, and some of the things that you are doing and you are, you know, fostering in your in your daily daily work. Uh, I think that again, the topic is uh, not only very interesting, but it's here to stay for us uh, for for quite some time, and the pandemic has accelerated many of these of these needs so with that said i want to thank our audience for their attendance this uh, afternoon and we will see you at our next webinar be well thank, thank you, you so much bye take care rachel